He had his gun, so he just swung it open. I start to notice that, you know, the atmosphere feels a little bit weird. First thing he seen was this six and a half foot tall, broad shoulder, dark hair, that freaked him out. We hadn't talked to her about like life and death and what any of that means. She's three years old, you know. So we turned around, suddenly there's a whole tree falling across the road. And she was describing to us that, you know, there was a deceased person uh, that she could she, she could see visually. You're listening to Cryptid Clues, where we tackle the ever-expanding history and mystery of monsters and supernatural madness every Monday. You can find us at cryptidclues.ca for more information, or even check out exclusive content and support us at patreon.com slash cryptidclues. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Corrupted Clues. I am your host, Taylor. And before we get into today's topic, I must apologize. I was promoting it all in the feeds and all on well, last week's episode that we were going to tackle our Nicola Valley Bigfoot Conference post attendance discussion for this week's episode. But Ruben has unfortunately become very ill under the weather and just scheduling wise, it's been hard to kind of time it and, you know, life and everything like that. So he messaged me. He felt very, very bad. And I said, Ruben, get better that is a priority so we're pushing it one more week so i say this and i mean it next week you'll be able to hear all of our discussions on that so in the meantime i have taken a crack here and dived into a very very interesting topic for today's episode we're diving into the orang mawa now this was a sasquatch like cryptid that i had actually heard about at the conference by one of the presenters now they didn't mention it by name but they mentioned Malaysia. They were kind of going through Bigfoot and naming off all of the different regions that different, I call cousins, I guess you could say, to Sasquatch were all residing from. And when they mentioned Malaysia, it got me really curious. I threw it in my notes, and here we are. So I did some digging, and I can't wait to get into this. Now, let's start from the very, very top. In Malaysian folklore, this cryptid goes by two names, the Orang Mawa and the Orang Dalam. And they reside in the Johor jungle in Malaysia, which is exactly where uh, we begin this cryptid investigation, essentially, the location. Johor is a state of Malaysia in the south of the Malay Peninsula. And Johor shares maritime borders with Singapore, which is more off to the south, and Indonesia, which is off to the west and east. Now, the state's population is 4 million as of 2020, making it the second most populated state in Malaysia. And the amount of territorial disputes, war, occupations that have all occurred here are truly exponential. That was something that I was kind of trekking through as I was trying to isolate more like the floor fauna and the geography. And it was just incredible how much history that actually has unfolded here for humanity. And we can go back and talk about the fact that they found artifacts that are dated around 150 AD. It's incredibly fascinating, but I digress. Let's talk about the geography. Now, the total land area of Johor is 19,166 square kilometers, which is an equivalent of 7,400 square miles. Now, surrounded by the South China Sea over to the east, the Johor Straits south, and the Straits of Malacca to the west, a total coastline length of 400 kilometers, 250 miles. However, there's around... 237.7 237.7 kilometers, an equivalent of 147.7 miles of it, has actually been eroding away. And a majority of these coastlines as well are actually covered with mangroves and nipa forests. And just to explore that a little bit, the mangrove is a term used for shrubs and trees that grow in coastal waters. And nipa is a series of palms that are native to coastlines of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And it's basically the only palm that is adapted to the mangrove biome. So 83% of Johar's terrain is lowlands areas, with around 17% in a higher, more steepish terrain. While the state of Johar is dotted with many isolated peaks, is a fairly and consistently flat region all across. And the highest point, however, is Mount Ladang, also known as Mount Ophir, which has a height of 1,276 meters. 
much of Johor's central areas are completely covered in dense forest with an extensive network of rivers that interconnect the mountains and hills outwards towards the west, east, and southern parts of the state. Now, I took a look at some photos. I highly recommend you do as well. This place is just absolutely beautiful, and it is very prominent for tourism as well. In terms of biodiversity, the Yohar jungles are home to a massive, diverse array of plant and animal species. With a total estimated 950 vertebrate species, this is comprised of 200 mammals, 600 birds, 150 reptiles, and there's also over 2,000 invertebrates. It's incredibly diverse. And just with you know, our luck, we have a national park here. Now, I'm not saying only one. There is a bunch of national parks, but I want to focus specifically on this one, the Andau Rompin National Park. A protected tropical rainforest in northeastern Johor, it covers 870 square kilometers, 340 square miles. During monsoon season, however, from November to March, with fishing banned, of course, from September to October, no one's allowed in. So we have five to six months of time where a species can flourish without human interaction. No worry about stepping into the spotlight with a human being or anything like that. Granted, Monsoon season is very dangerous. This could totally be a justification like, hey, we don't want people going in there, period, because you'll get hurt, you'll get lost, all this kind of stuff. It's not justifying the fact that cryptids are running around for five to six months of the year. But I do believe that level of intelligence can identify the situation and see this as an opportunity, especially if they're savvy enough to navigate themselves accordingly and safely. They know the land. They know those danger areas. That just seems, at least to me, it adds a little bit more fuel to that fire, especially, again, knowing humans aren't around at these times of the year. So they could migrate out of there and then they come back at this time of the year. Heck, I feel like they would take full advantage of that time. It's like being home with no babysitter and your parents are out for the weekend. <laughs> That's how I equate it. But my, my last bit on the national park is that the Enda Rumpin is one of the oldest tropical rainforest complexes in the world. And some of the rock formations that it actually holds and homes there are around 240 million years old. So this is definitely a very aged area. Some of the flora and fauna I wanted to mention is the Malayan tiger, the Indo-Chinese leopard, clouded leopard, Asian golden cat, leopard cat, marbled cat, Asian elephant, Malipian tapir, the Bornean bearded pig, barking deer, dusty leaf monkey, and it used to have the biggest remaining population of the at-risk northern Sumatran rhinoceros species of the Malay Peninsula. But they are sadly now extinct in the wild for the whole of Malaysia. There is also the Golem's toad, which is only known to exist in the National Park. Now, Malaysia, as I mentioned earlier, has a multitude of national parks, and Johor itself has a ton of protected areas. But as you may know as a reoccurring theme, my goal with the geography and the diversity of these regions is very important. It helps paint a picture for you as a listener on how possible it could be for a large cryptid, or in this case, bipedal creature, to exist in this area. So to me, we see a reliable food source, uh, almost a consistently six-month period every year where no humans trekking into specific areas that are very nearby. Now, it's just it to me it makes sense that something of that heightened intelligence could thrive here, could identify these areas, know where to live, where to really kind of habituate itself. It just it, it clicks, and I feel like especially in the Pacific Northwest, Sasquatch is absolutely exercising the the same thing. And again, humans aren't really trekking too far up north. There's a lot of areas in the Pacific Northwest you can hide in. But when it comes to a place like Malaysia, and you have population just kind of growing and growing and a plethora of other predators that you're fighting, again, there's a, a large roster of cats and big cats that you're dealing with. So something like this definitely has to be able to defend itself. And uh, again, I'm sure it's using a lot of these predators as a food source. But I digress. With all that information explored, let's touch down on this actual cryptid. Like its Pacific Northwest cousin, this cryptid is also reportedly 10 feet tall, bipedal, covered in black fur or brown fur in some cases, with red eyes in those reports as well. And a very horrid stench of urine is often associated with this cryptid. 
And through reports, uh, we can tell that this thing has been caught feeding on fish and actually raiding orchards. Sightings for the Moas go back as far as 1871, but it also has that classical assumption and notion that it's basically a Gigantopithecus descendant. That is usually the assumption for many Sasquatch. Tracks have been found in the region, and I'm going to specifically date here 1995, where four toad tracks were actually found. And this is a common thing with other Sasquatch sightings, is deformed-looking footprints that are sometimes left behind. I photographed a few at oh, some of our local Sasquatch museums where you can see Bigfoot with very warped feet, I guess you could say, that have left these impressions in to be to be casted. But as far as these four-toed tracks go, they were measured with a length of around 16 to 19 inches long and a width of 8 to 10 inches wide. That is a very, very big foot. If we jump ahead to 2005 in November, we can see that there is a very publicized sighting that took place when three workers were actually clearing the ground out for a new pond that was going to be installed. And they spotted an entire family of moas. Two adults and one infant were seen walking alongside the riverside. And after the sighting, the workers managed to locate the footprints. One of them measured 18 inches long. It was photographed, and I really tried to locate it as it was published in the Malaysian newspaper back in January 2006. I did not prove successful, but this was definitely a turning point. The government team was actually formed post this experience and publishing with a task to search for more evidence of the Moaz. This official expedition was announced in late January 2006 with, again, the goal to prove that this creature's existence was real. Reports started to leak out that an orang moas was actually captured in Johor. As a result of this expedition, this started in April of 2006, but official reports afterwards have denied it. Now, this is the start of a topic I want to explore more in depth with Ruben and kind of like transitioning over from our expedition we were just talking about, but coexistence with other small animals like birds. When I was researching the orang moas, I found some interesting claims that they handle exterior bugs and mites, the birds, you could say which benefits the orang moas. And in exchange, those birds get to use the hair fibers for nest building and such. So it's very much a habitual trade-off where both species can thrive in one environment with each other's assistance. Now, this is very, very fascinating, and I did not think of this in any other application, but for example, this is a very real setting, ostriches and zebras. Both are prominent prey animals and require a heightened sense to avoid danger. The issue, however, is that zebras do not have the greatest sense of smell, but they have an incredible sense of sight. And ostrich, who don't have good eyesight, have an immaculate sense of smell. So together, these senses form a bond that allows both species to survive and avoid their you know, predators that are in the area. So something this is, again, I fully plan to explore in another episode with apes and Bigfoot and just kind of get Ruben's opinion on there because I think that if we were to look into this Malaysian cohabituation system and apply that to the Pacific Northwest. Not even with cryptids, but just looking at primates in general and seeing these connections that they share in these cohabitating scenarios. I think that there is something very fascinating we can crack in there. And this is not to go off tangent, but something that me and Ruben like to dabble into with our Bigfoot episodes is examining new researched points with current apes and looking at them and seeing how we could apply that to real scenarios with Sasquatch, whether it's through Trinox communication or just a plethora of different things. This is a great new topic we're going to dive into. I digress. My tangent is ending now. Let's get into some more sightings. In 1959, we have a mining engineer who is sleeping in his boat by the lakeside when all of a sudden, Something lifted up part of the boat's roof. The engineer switched their flashlight on and saw a huge red eye staring back at them. The next day, he went out to explore and he was able to actually find 18-inch tracks in the mud. So this is very, very uh, fitting, befitting of uh, the previous reports and the previous track uh, recordings. In 1970, two gentlemen photographed giant hominid tracks 19 inches tall and 10 inches wide. And these were trekked across a sandbar in the upper reaches of the End River. 
jumping all the way ahead to 1979, students at the Vocational Institute near the Brack State reported seeing 10-foot-tall hairy bipedal creatures at night during the second week of August. So while these creatures approach humans in a relatively friendly manner, they do still seem to frighten easily and run off. The red eyes are interesting as well as we've discussed it before. It may not be a very positive component, at least in association to our North American Sasquatch, but it's crazy how common this feature is across all of these bipedal hairy creatures and their worldwide cousins seen all around the world. Now, they don't always all have red eyes. There's yellow eyes, black beady eyes. It's very different, but it's very fascinating how it's a reoccurring thing. Now, I know this episode is titled The Orang Moa, but I'm going to sneak in something from the north. Located in Indonesia, this cryptid is believed to be another one of the cousins of Bigfoot because of its shared characteristics. They have a height of around 7.5 to 12 feet tall and are covered in dark, bushy hair. Sightings of these cryptids have been reported for centuries. Reports of these creatures are that it's nocturnal, shy, and an omnivore. Very much like the Pacific Northwest relative, so too do these like to explore campsites after dark, leaving only their footprints behind. They are also claimed to emit a very odd whistling sound. And, believe it or not, toss stones from hidden locations. Again, it's just fascinating how cultures and people from different parts of the world are reporting the same thing, the same mannerisms, and the same pieces of evidence. That is, an, I'm getting a little bit too excited tonight as I record this episode, but that's either an incredibly immaculate, immaculate plan, a hoax going across the world, but I can't imagine that these very remote villages and people that don't give a flying fudge about the internet or fame or anything would go to such lengths when it is already invested in Malaysian folklore. It's already invested in Indonesian history by centuries. So you have to remember and take those things into account. Now, the interesting thing about this bipedal cryptid is the report that I have of a possible attack. Now, we have a village in eastern Indonesia, which was the subject to an attack by wild monkeys that went absolutely rampant, entering homes and attacking the residents back in 2013, only 10 years ago. One of the spokespersons for the Sidendeng Repang district in South Sulawesi province stated that on the Wednesday, about 10 monkeys attacked the village. There was a 16-year-old boy that had to be treated in the hospital after being badly bitten by one of them. The spokesperson said that the animals were thought to have come from a nearby forest to which local authorities are investigating why the monkeys, which are normally afraid of humans and flee when people get close to them, would even consider emerging and attacking. Monkeys are definitely not uncommon in Indonesia. However, some of the descriptions of these primates were that they were around five feet tall, so definitely smaller. However, this is larger than any Asian primate. They also stood upright bipedally as they walked, along with a gorilla-like stubby nose as per the reports. These reports additionally included that the creatures were tailless. This is again a trait only apes have. And it's prominent assumption that this attack was orchestrated by the orangutan. Again, conspiracies are encrypted. Uh, zoolog cryptozoologists all come to that conclusion that we can safely say it's the orangutan. But upon further research, it seems that this region in general just holds a plethora of primate cryptids. There are many other names, many other different types. It was actually quite surprising. I have a few of them saved because I might dive into them in future episodes. But that's where I'm going to call it for this week's episode. Now, with Ruben on the mend, I've got my notes on the Bigfoot Conference all prepped. So we should be ready to drop it for you guys next week. And additionally, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be diving into the co-habitual relationships between different species and different types of animals and how possibly they could tie into Bigfoot and smaller creatures. There is so much more amazing comparisons that we can create here and we can just dive into. And the more I learn about different countries, different regions across the world, separated by oceans that all have their own embedded Bigfoot Sasquatch equivalent stories and folklore. It's just absolutely incredible how cemented Sasquatch is in human history and human culture. It's something that I think people kind of just let go over their head. 
There's not just one Bigfoot out there in the Pacific Northwest. There's a lot of them, and they are all over the world, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but I digress. Till then, you can find us on a multitude of social media channels, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. We're also on Patreon, where you can get ad-free episodes. And should you wish to send us an email, you can via cryptedclues at gmail.com. If you want to just ask us a question or wish to share an encounter on the show, by all means. Until next time, take care and stay safe.